Thank you, Tim. I'd be remiss if I didn't start by saying happy birthday, Tim Brewster, our beloved organist. Did I get that right? Yes. Yes. Happy birthday. Thanks for joining us for your birthday, Tim, and getting us off on the right foot. Good morning, folks, and welcome to worship at Williamsburg Baptist Church. My name is Art Wright, and I'm the pastor here. And whether you're here with us in the room this morning or joining us online, we're thrilled that you're here. Today is the third Sunday in the Easter season, and as I think about where we are at as a congregation, resurrection and new life seem like perfect metaphors for what we're up to at Williamsburg Baptist Church. We see signs of new life in our midst everywhere we look these days. And what a gift that you all are with us this morning as part of worship as we gather to worship God together. I promised myself I would be shorter than usual during my welcome because we have a full service today, but do do want to give you a few updates. First, a word of gratitude to Teresa Bobbitt for spearheading a wonderful church yard sale yesterday morning. I haven't heard all of the details yet, but everything that I did here was great. So, Teresa, thank you so much for all the ways that you led that and for everyone who volunteered to support this community event. We are, right after worship today, there's a young adult small group interest meeting. Uh, We're going to meet down the hall. If you want to grab a cup of coffee and then head down the hall, we'd love to talk about what it looks like to start a small group for folks who are in that young adult phase of life. I'm going to let you self-categorize whether or not you fall into that phase. But we're also looking at starting another small group as well. So if you're interested in joining a small group, we'd love for you to reach out to me and I'll add you We'll add your name to my list. Um, Next Saturday night, we are co-hosting a board game night with Love is Love Tidewater. It's going to be in the South Wing from 6 to 9 p.m. Love is Love is a LGBTQ plus affirming organization that's local, and they reached out to us. I think they used to host board games regularly, and so this is sort of like a reboot post pant post-pandemic now Uh, and so we're delighted to welcome them back and to and all are welcome it's a family board game night so we'd love for you to join us next saturday 6 to 9 p.m in the south wing byo game i hear later this morning we will do communion for the first time in over two years with actual bread and so um, delighted to return to some, this, um, this sacred tradition together. Wanted to let you have a heads up because some of you might not feel comfortable taking bread from a plate at this point. Uh, if you are, wonderful. If not, that's okay too. But uh, just in the interest of full disclosure, I don't know how this is going to work. I haven't done this since I've been here, but we're going to give it our best shot. And we will have an usher. Uh, take around a tray of the single-serve communion cups uh, if you don't feel comfortable taking bread from the plate at this point in the pandemic. We just want everyone to feel like they can participate to their comfort level. Last but not least, if you will at some point in the worship service, grab one of these attendance cards from the pew back in front of you. would love to simply have a record of your presence with us this morning if you'll at least give us your name but you can give us as much information as you want. We promise not to sign you up for any uh, you know, organizational email lists uh, unless you want us to add you to our e-newsletter. All right. Welcome one and all to worship. We really are glad you're here.
Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship responsibly. We gather as people on a journey. We believe and we have doubts. We do good and we sin. We are imperfect humans and also beloved by God. We seek forgiveness and grace from the one and from those we have harmed. We yearn for a new way, a new perspective, and a clean path. Speak to us, God. Continue creating us. Guide our actions, enlighten our minds, and inspire our hearts as we worship together. Now, if you can stand while we sing, O oh, sons and daughters, let us sing. As we move into a time of prayer, I'd like to share a few additions to our weekly prayer um, list that we send out on Friday afternoons. Certainly want to encourage you to continue praying for Ed Sadowski as he recovers from back surgery about a week and a half ago. Reports are positive. He was actually with us during the Sunday school hour this morning, uh, but just didn't think he could make it through an hour of church as well. He continues to be in a lot of pain, so covet your prayers for him. We're praying for Daniel Scruggs on his multi-week journey across the country to share his musical talents and instruments with children and youth in schools and other organizations. Certainly we're praying for William and Mary students as they enter the home stretch these weeks ahead as they have final papers and exams and so forth. 
Several of us, about nine of us, are signed up to go to the Holy Land in just over two weeks. So we covet your prayers for us as we, as we prepare and pack and try to figure out COVID testing for that trip. Uh, we're departing on May 16th to travel to Israel and Palestine. Some of you all may know that the United Methodist Church is going through a difficult season right now. Some of us grew up in the Methodist Church in this room. The Methodist Church is my cradle faith. Today, a group is splitting off from it to form the Global Methodist Church. And I only think it's uh, fair to mention that, uh, that we pray for them, for our Methodist siblings in faith as they navigate this fracturing season. Uh, largely over theological differences in opinions about marriage equality and so forth. And so uh, I'm praying for peace and forgiveness and love and abundance for our Methodist siblings, even in the midst of their conflict. Finally, we're continuing to pray for peace in Ukraine as we read each day about new updates to that conflict. Lead us, Lynn. Thank you, Lord. For all those we've heard about and for all those in our hearts that need the prayer, we uh, are going to enter prayer now. Please join me. In the evening, when the disciples met, frightened behind locked doors, you come to them with words of peace, for wicked plots have failed, and the cruelty of the world has come to nothing, and the betrayal and the denial of friends have not prevailed. Life-giving God, we give you thanks for Jesus has risen. He comes to us with words of peace. Come to us today in government rooms where politicians meet, in city boardrooms where executives plan, in courtrooms where lawyers debate. Come with words of peace. In hospital rooms where people are waiting, in prison cells where people are afraid, in homes where people struggle to make ends meet. Come with words of peace. Come to us whenever we are afraid, whenever we are grieving. Come to us now, we pray in silence, for those we care for and are worried about, despite the strong and solid doors we lock, we protect ourselves to shut out the world. Come to us with words of peace. The Easter, this Easter, breathe on us again with your spirit, for you have overcome evil and wicked plots fail, and the cruelty of the world comes to nothing, and the betrayal and denial of friends do not prevail. Renew us in the power of your Spirit that we may open the doors and go out into the world to bring words of peace to the people we meet. Renew us in the power of your Spirit that we may have life in your name and go wherever you send us. In Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.
Jenny Davy, and I will be reading today's scripture from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. It was still the first day of the week that evening while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities. Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the, when the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told them, We've seen the Lord. But he replied, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand in my, into my side. No more disbelief. Believe. Then Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, Do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll. But these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God.
thanks Jenny, and thanks choir for a wonderful anthem. My wife Beth and I had the good fortune to travel to Italy in January of 2009, BC, before children. It was a wonderful trip. We flew into Venice and rode gondolas up and down the waterways. We ate, we ate pasta and pizza and gelato and drank coffee and wine. We hiked along the Mediterranean Sea in a little region uh, called Cinque Terre on the coast. We got to see the ancient ruins of Rome, including the marvelous Colosseum. We watched the sunset from the top of the Duomo Cathedral in Florence. It was an amazing trip. I can't wait to get back there one of these days. But there's one moment that I always think about, that Beth and I always talk about whenever we think of that trip. We had a Rick Steves guidebook with us that we were using to get around, and one of the things that it said that we just had to do in Florence was to go see Michelangelo's statue of David in the Galleria dell'Accademia. I'd heard of the David statue before, but I had my doubts. After all, how impressive could a statue be? It's just a big hunk of marble, right? But according to Rick Steves, we just had to see it to believe it. So one afternoon after enjoying some amazing gelato, we made our way through town to the art museum, followed the crowds through several rooms inside, past entirely unmemorable paintings on the wall. And then we turned the corner into this long gallery and literally gasped. About 50 feet away down the hall, stood the 17 foot tall marble statue of David. Towering over the room, his sling held casually over his left shoulder, his body tense and ready for battle. Nothing could have prepared us for the sheer beauty and magnitude of, of seeing that statue. We walked it up to it and approached it with awe and spent the better part of a half an hour just wandering around it examining it from all angles and marveling how beautiful it was. To this day, whenever Beth and I talk about that trip, we both remember gasping as we turned the corner and, and saw the statue for the first time. I wish I could find words to do it justice in this sermon, but it's one of those things in life that you just have to see it to believe it. I wonder if any of you can think of something in your life that you never would have believed if you hadn't seen it or experienced it for yourself. I, for one, feel like I can empathize with Thomas in today's reading. Two weeks ago, we read John's Easter morning account. Last week, we pushed pause on our, our journey through the Gospel of John for Lisa Wolf's wonderful sermon on Ecclesiastes. But today we turn the page back to John chapter 20, and this is actually our last Sunday in the Gospel of John. We've been there for months now. Next week we'll turn the page to Acts, and then we'll end up in Philippians until Pentecost. The scripture reading that Jenny shared begins on the evening of the first Easter. Earlier in the day, you'll recall, Peter and the beloved disciple had seen the empty tomb, Mary Magdalene had actually encountered the risen Lord, and then she reported to the disciples what she had seen. But I can't help but wonder what in the world is going through their heads as they're sitting in that upper room in this scene. They've locked the doors because they're afraid. They've heard the good news from Mary Magdalene, but they aren't ready to celebrate yet. It's as if it's too good to be true like they have to see it to believe it. Lo and behold, the resurrected Jesus suddenly appears in the room with them, and John doesn't cue us in on how Jesus gets in the room, only that he appears to them with a physical body, one that they can touch and see. Jesus says, peace be with you, God shalom be with you. He shows them his hands and his side where he's been wounded. And the disciples are filled with joy at seeing their Lord. But this isn't just going to be a dinner party. There's a commission. Jesus says, as the Father, 
As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. This is a crucial moment in the narrative. It's a pivotal moment. As the Father sent me into the world, embodied in flesh with good news, so I am sending you. Jesus' mission becomes his followers' mission. It becomes our mission to love abundantly, recklessly even, to feed the hungry, to welcome the stranger, to welcome everyone to the table, especially those who have been left out for far too long, and to share good news about God's love and mercy and grace and forgiveness to a world that finds itself alienated from God. And finally, to embody the divine presence like Jesus does in the world and make reconciliation and relationship with God possible. Jesus gives them this message and then he breathes on them. It's not a COVID-friendly text, admittedly. I'm glad we didn't pick that up as one of the sacraments. But the moment evokes Genesis. Just as God breathed life into the first people, Jesus breathes new life into these followers. <sighs> Receive the Holy Spirit. And thus they become empowered for their mission. They become a new creation. Even if they are still afraid, even if they are still flawed, God still entrusts them to this holy and sacred responsibility to imperfect people. And if we ended the story there, if John ended the story there, that would be great. It would wrap up nicely. We could put a bow on it. But here's the thing. One disciple is missing. For some reason, Thomas is not with the disciples on that first evening after Jesus' resurrection. We have no idea where he is. For all we know, he may have just run down the street to Wawa or Chick-fil-A to get some snacks. But there's one conclusion that we can draw. Thomas is not so afraid that he has to be hiding behind locked doors. Whereas the other disciples have barricaded themselves in anxiously, wondering what to do next, Thomas is out in the world where followers of Christ are supposed to be. In fact, maybe he's already doing what Jesus is asking the others to do, to continue his mission. History has not always been kind to Thomas, and many of us probably know him best as Doubting Thomas. But I can't help but wonder if he deserves a second opinion. I didn't remember this until this past week when I was working on this sermon. In John chapter 11, when Jesus says he has to go to save Lazarus, Thomas is the one disciple who chimes in and, and says, let's go die together with Jesus too. He understands the risk involved and he's the one who's evidently willing to risk it all to follow his Lord. I can't help but wonder if rather than calling him Doubting Thomas, we might ought to call him Courageous Thomas or Brave Thomas. When he shows back up at the upper room on that first Easter evening, the, the other disciples tell him what happened, that they encountered Jesus, and oh, by the way, you just missed him. Poor guy. Thomas responds famously, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hand in his side, I won't believe. Interpreters have tended to view this statement as a lack of faith on his part. But notice that Thomas is only asking for what the other disciples have already experienced for themselves. Jesus, Jesus showed them his wounds, and now Thomas is saying that he needs a similar experience. And let's give Thomas credit for this. He knows what he needs, and he's not afraid to ask for it. That's more than many of us can say sometimes, right? 
A week passes before Thomas will encounter Jesus himself. And I can't help but wonder what the week is like for him. Is it awkward being around the other disciples who have encountered Jesus? Feeling like the odd person out, the only one who hasn't met Jesus after his resurrection, the only one who doesn't yet fully understand or believe? On the other hand, they don't kick him out either. They're all willing to lean into the tension of the moment, trusting that people of faith come to understand who Jesus is in different ways and at different times. There's a tendency within religious circles to think that my experience of God has been such and such, and so that's normal. Everyone else should have the same experience that I do with God, or they should understand God just like me. But reality is far from that, at least as we read it in John's Gospel. Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, Mary Magdalene, Peter, and the other disciples, they all take their own different path to understanding and to faith. Their diversity of experience and faith is a good thing. Not everyone has to have the same experience or the exact same beliefs to be a part of the community. So when Jesus shows up a week later, Thomas is still with them. Jesus, notice, doesn't scold Thomas for doubt, but rather offers him exactly what he asked for, a chance to see and touch his wounds. We don't know if Thomas actually touched him or not, but he does respond, my Lord and my God. He acknowledges the fullness of Jesus' identity in that moment. And if you're keeping score, Thomas is actually the first person in John's gospel to identify Jesus as God. His faith journey is different than the other disciples, but he eventually comes to an even deeper understanding of who Jesus is than they do. One of the reasons I love being your pastor in this congregation that it doesn't feel like there's a box that I have to fit into in this place. And it doesn't feel like there's a box that you all have to fit into either for that matter. And to be honest, that is a rare gift in churches, isn't it? Probably at some point or another, all of us have felt like we've had to fit ourselves and our beliefs and the ways in which we present ourselves into the world, to the world in order to conform but this text recognizes that our experience are, and faith are different, that our needs are different. The text also acknowledges the complexity and difficulty into believing when we don't have proof. Thomas needed proof and he wasn't afraid to ask for it. Folks, if you struggle to believe, you're in good company. Even Thomas couldn't believe without proof. At the same time, this text encourages us to create communities that not only tolerate doubt, but hold sacred space for it. Doubt is not a bad word. It's not something you have to hide. It's better to be honest and authentic. And I can't help but think that Thomas serves as, as an exemplar in this way for us all. If you'll permit me one final thought that kept percolating through my mind this past week. Sunday, April 19th, 2020. I was in a small office at home. It's teeny tiny. The door was closed. I felt like I was sealed in a room just like the disciples were on that first evening. As I recorded a sermon, on this exact passage. Deb's smiling because she remembers it. This was the first sermon I ever preached for Williamsburg Baptist Church. I was in a room at home behind locked doors, and I couldn't help but resonate with the disciples because of how afraid we all felt at that time. Remember April 2020? Anybody remember? We just blocked it out, right? <laughs> 
It was such a powerful text to me then because I remember the fear as we all hid inside our homes, for lack of a better word, because of the pandemic raging outside. There is a time to be behind closed doors. That was the time. But then Jesus appears to us and says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And I can't help but feel like today, two years later, Williamsburg Baptist Church, and a whole host of other churches too for that matter, but Williamsburg Baptist Church is being called and invited to God, by God to fling open those doors, to figure out what it now means to be sent into the world, embodying Jesus' presence. Church, it's time to be brave and courageous as we move forward in this next chapter together. It's time to be like Thomas. It's time to open the doors and be the church. And it's time to go out there and share good news with the world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you be bowed for the offertory prayer? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come together as one to serve on the pathway you have set forth for us. You have spoken. Now it is our duty to respond to you and share of our talents and the gifts that you have bestowed upon us. We know you hear our prayers and we ask your guidance along the way. In Christ's name, amen.
you may be seated. Folks, if you're watching at home, we'd love for you to participate in communion as we gather at table together. We'd simply ask that you go get something from your pantry, whether it's bread and juice or wine or some ordinary staples to celebrate. We just want you to feel like you can participate as well. For those of you who are gathered in this room, you should know that, at least in this church, we believe that this is not a Baptist table or Williamsburg Baptist table, but rather this is Christ's table. And all are welcome to participate in communion here if you would like to. On the night that Jesus gathered in the upper room, not to encounter Thomas and the disciples for the first time, but a few nights before, the last meal that they shared before his crucifixion, they gathered to celebrate together and to share a meal together. I don't think there was gluten-free bread on the plates like there is on these plates, but during the meal he did take a loaf of bread, and he blessed it, and then he broke it. And then he gave it to them, saying, Friends, this is my body. Take and eat of it. Remember, just as I have embodied God's presence in the world, so too will you embody God's presence in the world. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat. In the same way, after the meal, he took a cup. And after he had poured it, he gave thanks. 
hands he gave it to them, saying, This cup represents a new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of you and the forgiveness of all. Take and drink of it as often as you will in remembrance of me. This is the cup of salvation. Take and drink in remembrance. Let us pray. God, for the gift of this table to gather around as community, we give you thanks. For bread broken, it represents your body and wine or juice shared in a cup. It represents your blood. We give you thanks. May these sacred elements remind us of your grace and mercy and forgiveness and love and empower and sustain us as you send us to be the body of Christ into the world this day and forevermore. Amen. Friends, will you stand now and sing as we respond our hymn of invitation, All Are Welcome, printed in your bulletin, verses 1 and 3. Let's stand and sing together.
years. We've added some faces around here. We've lost some faces around here. And yet we gather. We figured it out. We might have been a little bit rusty, but we celebrate together. We move now into a time of recognition where we honor those who are graduating. I know at least two of the six graduates that I know of are in this room. If, if our graduates would come forward and stand up here with me, if you're willing, Zachary, you want to come stand with me? I hate to put you on the spot, we love, but we love to see your faces. If anyone else is graduating, high school, college, graduate school, trade school, or whatever, you're welcome to come forward too. We want to honor you today. We, um, and we, I'd be remiss if I didn't say Griffith Ruck, Emma Hale, Melissa, who is David's granddaughter, and uh, Autumn, who is our office administrator's daughter, couldn't be with us this morning, but we honor them as well. We are so grateful and so proud of you two as you approach this threshold, as you move from one season of life to the next. You both have worked so hard, and uh, we look back and marvel at the ways in which you all have been faithful to who God has been calling you to be in the world. We feel so, we feel so honored to stand with you at this threshold moment as you look ahead to the future as well. We certainly send you to whatever is next with all of our blessings and best wishes. We hope that this place will always feel like home in some form or fashion to you, even if you do go further afield. But we want you to know that we send you with our prayers and love. We also have a gift to share with you this morning. Everyone's experience varies when they graduate. But I've heard enough folks tell me at some point or another that graduation, as much of a celebration as it is, can be a hard moment as well. It's a mystery sometimes, what is next? I remember landing in graduate school, all of a sudden feeling totally outside of my element. I had imposter syndrome, feeling like I don't belong here, I don't deserve to be here, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough. Nothing I've done before now has prepared me to step into this place. There's a story in the New Testament about Jesus and his disciples. They see a temple, they're in the temple, and Jesus points out a woman in the crowd, and she has two small coins in her hand, and she puts them in the temple treasury. We know them now as widow's mites. They're pennies, really not even that. They're just about as worthless as you can imagine. I hate to say we're giving you a worthless gift. It's actually worth more nowadays, and they're actually kind of expensive to buy on the internet. <laughs> this, is, this is a widow's mite, though. And when Jesus saw this woman put these coins into the temple treasury, he said, truly this woman is offering more to God in this moment than all the other folks who have come before. We offer you a widow's mind as a gift, thinking that maybe you'll set it on a bookshelf or on your desk or next to your bed or something. And then every time you look at it, you remember that God is calling you to be fully you in the world and to offer your love and your gifts, and that God is calling you to be you and to transform God's world in love. My hope is that on the hard days especially, you'll look at this and remember that what you have to offer is more valuable than you can even begin to imagine. And when you do, remember us too and know that we're praying for you and we love you and we're celebrating for you too as well. Can we pray for you as we prepare to cross this threshold together? Let us pray. God, for Zachary and Jane Ann and the others in this community of faith who are about to cross a threshold and graduate, we give you thanks. What a gift and a blessing it has been for them to be a part of this community of faith, enlivening in our worship through gifts of music, and in other ways as well, smiles and joy. 
God, we honor them in this moment and ask that you will walk with them in this season of life as they cross from one journey to the next. And that as they do so, they might always experience your presence with them in powerful ways, knowing that you are calling them to love and serve and be the presence of Christ in the world. And that as they do so, they might also remember that they always have a home here where folks are cheering for them and rooting for them and praying for them every step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We love you too. We send you with all the best wishes and this gift as a reminder of our affection. Thank you all. We give them a hand as they prepare. <laughs> What a good day to be in worship together. Just a couple of reminders from me before a benediction. Would love for you to stay and linger if you can. Would love for you to get to know something new, someone new. I saw Dottie and Tom Jordan setting up some delightful goodies just around the corner in the fellowship lounge. So would love for you to make your way. You can either go this way or this way. The fellowship lounge is, is basically on the other side of that wall. Would love for you to go have a cup of coffee and something to eat and fellowship with one another together. We're also going to, for those of you interested in the young adult small group, going to head down the hall and talk for a little bit and dream about what that group is going to look like. Now receive these words of benediction as we prepare to depart. Friends, as Christ birthed for, burst forth from the tomb, may new life burst forth from us and show itself in acts of love and healing to a hurting world. And may the same Christ, who lives forever and is the source of all our new life, keep your hearts rejoicing and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.
Go in peace.